Well, I want to share with you something that uh, I believe is very timely, something very timely and very important for believers. And uh, so I want to speak today to, to, the, to the believers, to the Christians, to those who follow Jesus. And we're going to be talking about the biblical principle of seeking God, seeking God. And the, the title of today's message is Peace in the Land, Peace in the Land in the land. Now, that probably wouldn't describe <laughs> what we see on television and the, our conversations that we have throughout the week. Uh, that, it probably is not a good description of, of what we see with our physical eyes in our country right now, but I'm here to tell you today that there can be peace in the land. Peace in the land. Someone say amen to that. Come on. So, uh, if you would, open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles, chapter 14, 2 Chronicles 14, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 2 Chronicles 14. <laughs> Somewhere right there, right? No, it's going to be in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 14. And over the next few times that I share with you, we're actually going to be in uh, this portion of 2 Chronicles from 15 to chapter 20, but today, I'm sorry, 14 to chapter 20, but today we're going to look at the uh, chapter 14. It's only 15 verses long, so it's not a, a long portion of scripture, but I do want to read that uh, with you here in just a moment. So go ahead and put your finger there, but while you're looking for that, I want to talk to you about the principle of seeking God. Seeking God. It's a biblical principle found all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and here is the wonderful thing about this biblical principle is that almost in every time you see it in the Word of God, there is a promise attached to it. And the promise is that if you seek God, you will be blessed. Come on, I don't know if you heard that. If you seek God, you will be blessed. Come on. This is good, church. This is good. I want to show you that right here. Uh, we're going to start in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. You don't have to turn there, but I want to read it for you. It says, but from there you will search again for the Lord your God, and if you search for him with all your heart and soul, you will find him. That's good. That's good. Jeremiah 29, verse 13 this is God speaking. He says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6 says, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Have you ever been, you, you've, you've had a couple of big decisions to make right in front of you, one or the other. Have you ever been in that place where you say, God, what do I do? What do I do? Do I go this way or do I go that way? I love this biblical promise right here that if you seek him, seek his will and all you do, he will show you which path to take. It's an incredible promise. Now let's look at the New Testament, Luke chapter 12, verse 31. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. That's an incredible promise right there. It's an incredible, we don't have, as Christians, I, let me just say this, as Christians, we do not have to stress about the things we need. We just have to seek God. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. And number two, he must believe that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. There's a, a bit, this is a biblical principle, church. If we will seek God, he is a rewarder. He will give you the, the benefits and the blessings of heaven. And if you seek him, the promise is there that you will find him. Here's the last portion of scripture I want to, uh, I, actually, I'm sorry, two more, I lied. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. It says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on Come on, help me. Keep on. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, check this out, 
everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And here's the last verse. John chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, it says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. They were coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, Jesus asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? I love this next verse, though. He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. This, this biblical principle is so dear to God's heart. I love this. The people, they were coming to look for, they were looking for Jesus. Jesus sees this huge crowd as they're, they're forming, and they're, they're looking around. Where is he? Where is the miracle worker? Where's the guy we've been hearing about? And Jesus sees them coming, and he asks Philip, he's like, hey, you see these people? It looks like, I don't know, five to 10 to 15,000 people coming this way. Yeah. Um, how are we going to feed them, Philip? I can imagine Philip being like, oh, I don't know. But Jesus knew. He already knew. Because those that seek him, he's going to feed. He's going to bless. It's a biblical principle coming straight from the heart of God. So what does it mean to seek the Lord? What does it mean to seek? So there's a Hebrew word that's used in the Old Testament whenever, it's, whenever you hear this word seek. It comes from the Hebrew word darash, which means to seek or to resort to, to consult with, to require, to practice, to investigate, to study, and to follow. And so whenever you read the word of God, it's, it's, I, I like you inserting these English words that this Hebrew word means in here. So uh, Deuteronomy 4.29 says, from there you will search again for the Lord. You can insert, you will consult with the Lord. And if you search for him or if you resort to him with all of your heart and soul, you will find him. This is what this word means. It means to seek, to search out, to investigate, to resort to. It's a wonderful, wonderful promise in the word of God. So now I want to read Second Chronicles chapter 14. This is a, a really fun story about a king in the Bible. His name is King Asa. He was the king of Judah, and uh, if you read through the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, it's actually a retelling of real-life historical events that happened. Someone took the time to, to write down in detail these historical events and compile them together. So the book of Second, First and Second Chronicles tells all about these kings that lived in Judah and in Israel and the things that happened while they were reigning. And if you look back into these books, I know some people might say, oh, I don't know. Listen, these are fun. Like, if you're looking for something interesting to read in the Bible, read these. This is like so much better than Hollywood. It tells you about all of these uh, political things that are happening in the region, all the economic things that are happening. Uh, we, I mean, you, you, you hear and read about collusion and, and you know, people spying on each other. And, and it's really interesting. I love that if, if anyone has ever said to you the Bible is boring, then I don't know what you should do to them, but you should probably just strongly remind them to read their Bible, because if they did, they would have a different opinion. It's so incredibly interesting. And so we're going to read about one king right here and what happened during his, his reign as king. Uh, so Second Chronicles chapter 14, it says, When Abijah died, that was Asa's father, the king, when Abijah died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Asa became the next king. And there was peace in the land for ten years. And Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. And what I find real interesting, if you read through these chronicles, most of the kings did what was evil in the sight of God. There are only a handful that truly did what was pleasing in the sight of God, and this is one of them. And so I want to encourage you as believers to, to look at these moments and, and pull out these biblical principles that are written down for us because it is so good. It will be so helpful to us. Verse 3. This is what Asa did. He removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his law and commands. Asa also removed the pagan shrines as well as the incense altars from every one of Judah's towns. 
So Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of, come on, y'all help me out, enjoyed a period of, oh, the main benefit I want us to extract from this biblical principle today is that when you seek the Lord, there will be peace. There will be peace. Wow. Verse 6, during those peaceful years, Asa was able to build up the fortified towns throughout Judah. No one tried to make war against him at this time, for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. Wow. Asa told the people of Judah, let us build towns and fortify them with walls, towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because... We sought the Lord our God, and he has given us peace on every side. That's powerful. So they went ahead with these projects and brought them to completion. And then the story kind of changes a little bit here. And it gets really interesting. Verse 8, King Asa had an army of 300,000 warriors from the tribe of Judah, armed with large shields and spears. He also had an army of 280,000 warriors from the tribe of Benjamin, armed with small shields and bows. Anyone want to do some quick math on that real quick? 580,000, thank you. 580,000 warriors. Both armies were composed of well-trained fighting men. Once, an Ethiopian named Zerah attacked Judah with an army of one million men and 300 chariots. I almost think it's kind of laughable how they even threw in the chariots. Like, you've got a million soldiers <laughs> and, and 300 chariots. There's 300 chariots too. <laughs> I don't know. I love how the Bible's so detailed. And they advanced from the town of Merishah. So Asa deployed his armies for battle in the valley north of Merishah. Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God. Oh, Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, oh, Lord, our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against this vast horde. Oh, Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. Wow. I think this is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to pray for those that are in a position of leadership in our country and in our state and in our county and in our city and in our schools because if the, our leaders will cry out to God. Now, this is, this is true for any believer that cries out to God, but I want you to notice what God does whenever one man, the king, cries out to him. Verse 12, so the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah. And the enemy fled. Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. And so many Ethiopians fell that they were unable to rally. They were destroyed by the Lord and his army. And the army of Judah carried off a vast amount of plunder. Wow. So here's the principle. If you seek God, if you seek God, there will be peace. But even when peace is threatened, if you seek God, there will still be peace. Come on, church. That's good. That's good. Notice, they didn't even have to fight. It says the Lord and his army defeated the Ethiopians. And Judah's army carried off the plunder. Wow, you're telling me that the biblical principle of seeking God means that God will fight on my behalf, that there will be peace, and not only that, that there will be blessing. Come on, that's good. Verse 14, while they were at Gerar, they attacked all the towns in that area. While we're here, we might as well. <laughs> and terror from the Lord came upon the people there. As a result, a vast amount of plunder was taken from these towns too. They also attacked the camps of herdsmen and captured many sheep, goats, and camels before finally returning to Jerusalem. And before we really get into the points this morning, I, I, I love this. It says, while they were at Gerar, you know, they, they chased this one million man army all the way to Gerar. And then they're like, 
Hey, uh, still pretty early in the day. While, while we're here, does anybody need anything? I mean, have, have you ever been, you know, at home and you're like, hey, uh, I've got to run to town. I've got to run to Walmart. Do you need anything while I'm there? I mean, it's almost like this was their mentality. There was so much peace in the land. It's like they're, they're, they're chasing this army and they're like, hey, while we're here, should we just go ahead and attack some of our other enemies? Like, I don't know. We might as well. Everybody's here. There's 580,000 of us. We got all of our spears and stuff. So let's let's go ahead. And they just start attacking their enemies all around that area. And then they, on the way back to Jerusalem, they, they attack their enemies in the fields. And, and they carry off all this plunder back. And the next time I speak, we're going to pick up in chapter 15 where, where the, the story doesn't end right here. It, it gets even better. But today I want to focus on this. Point number one. The first thing King Asa did in seeking the Lord was he eliminated distractions. He eliminated distractions. Now, I'm not a, uh, well, let me put it this way. I, I'm a pretty organized person. At home, I've, I've got a place for everything and everything is in its place. And so I I, I tend to get, I'm, I'll tell myself, I tend to get frustrated when I have to look for something. I don't like looking for things. I like to know where my things are. And I have a place for all of my things. And if my things aren't in their place, then what I do is, does anybody know? Hey, babe, have you seen my fill in the blank? My poor wife, y'all. My poor wife. I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Well, it's not right here. I always put it right here. I, I didn't do anything with it. You must have put it somewhere. No, 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 Emily, you don't understand. I always put it right here. And what normally happens is she's right. When, uh, the other day, is was, was right before Christmas, we were doing a little bit of online shopping and, and, uh, I can't remember if I was on Amazon or, or what side I was on buying something, and and uh, I had to get my card because it was saying, hey, your card needs to be updated. So I went in there, you know, I had to grab my card and find the security code and the date and, and type that all into the website there and, and uh, update my card. And I was, we were doing some online shopping, some Christmas shopping for a family, and we were both sitting there on the couch. We don't even hardly go to stores anymore to buy things. Is that bad? I don't know. But uh, we... <laughs> We have one day, it's usually Black Friday, we, we sit on our couch, we put on a Christmas movie after the kids have gone to bed, we make some hot chocolate, and we sit there and we do all of our Christmas shopping in one night. It's incredible, it's a, it's a blessing. But anyways, what had happened was, I took out my wallet, took out my card, and I updated it and I set it right there beside the couch. The next morning, whenever I get up, I cannot find my wallet, and so I go to my poor little wife and I, Emily, where is my, have you seen it? Did you move it? Is did the boys get it? I've got one boy that he's into everything. And so I'm like, did one of them get it? Have you seen it anywhere? And so I'm going around the house blaming everybody, and I was the one that left it out. <laughs> I do not like to look for things. I don't. My wife, she's not quite as organized as I would like for her to be. Uh, is there any other couple? Are we the only couple in the world that's that's like that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm so glad I'm not alone. <laughs> She's not quite as organized as I would like to be, but here's the thing about her. She can find anything. She can find anything. That's why I guess that's why I always go to her, because she can find anything. And maybe it's because she's not quite so organized as she's used to looking. I don't know. But here's one thing I found. If you're constantly looking, you're going to find stuff. But if you don't look for things, you won't find them. I've got an older brother He's the luckiest person in the world. I know a lot of people say there's no such thing as luck. Well, you haven't met my brother yet because apparently there's got to be some such thing as luck because he gets it all. I mean, that's why there's people like me who say there's no such thing as luck because I never get it. But he does. He finds all kinds of stuff. I remember we were little boys. I was probably seven or eight years old. We went to my great-grandparents' house. Uh, my mom took me and all my siblings over there, and, and uh, it was probably 95-ish degrees outside and probably 110 inside. And so all of us kids, we decided we were going to go outside to beat the heat in the middle of the summer. And so anyways, uh, we went outside and, and we were playing and running around. They had a garden in their backyard and, and we're running through the rows and, 
and uh, just having a good time. They had a pear tree back there. We're climbing the pear tree. And uh, my brother, he's running, and he stops. And I think I was chasing him. And so I stopped because, I mean, he just, like, stops, and he just kind of looks startled almost. And he's looking down at his foot, and I'm like, what's the matter? He said, dude, look at this. He moves away some dirt, and he picks it up, and it's an old Swiss Army knife. Looks like it's been there in the dirt for years, and I'm like, dude, that has to be from the Civil War. It's got to be. That thing is ancient. And so we take it into my great-grandfather, and he's like, would you look at that? He said, it's been a couple years since I lost that thing. I was like, a couple? He's like, Papa, I'm pretty sure that you were in the Civil War. Like, that's been down there a long time. It's getting muddy and rusty. And he said, well, thank you so much for finding that. Well, the next week, we went back out to visit them again. And my Papa said, hey, Rich, he's my older brother's name is Rich. He said, Rich, come here. So Rich came over there, and my, grand, my great-grandfather pulled out a brand-new Swiss Army knife. And he said, I just wanted to thank you so much for finding my knife here. I bought this one for you. And I remember thinking, what about the rest of us? We were all out there. But it was my brother that found it. I promise you, it couldn't have been a month later. We're out uh, at, at my parents' house, obviously, we're children. And so we're, we're out playing in the yard, and we have woods right there by the yard. We're out running around in the woods like we always did. And uh, my brother stops, and he's like, what's this? And he reaches down in the dirt again. I'm like, oh, great, he's going to get another pocket knife. He pulls it up. It is the most beautiful. It's about three inches long. The most beautiful Indian arrowhead you have ever seen in perfect condition. And I'm like, God, Why? Why? Why couldn't it have been me? You know, I pray the spirit of blindness on him, you know, so that I can. No, I'm just kidding. But he finds everything. If we went to Walmart, he would find $4.73 worth of loose change scattered out in the parking lot before we get to the door. I'm like, how do you find all of these things? Well, do you want to know why? It's because he's always, he's always looking. Everywhere he goes, he's looking for anything. He just walks around just looking. I still go hunting with him during hunting season. We go hunting every weekend together. And we walk through the woods uh, to get to the little duck holes that we go to, to hunt at. And, and whenever we're walking, he's not looking up ahead. He's looking straight down. And his eyes are just going like the whole time. He's just looking for anything that he can find. And I believe that that's a, a wonderful thing that we could adopt in our spiritual lives. We should always be looking for God. But here's the thing. If you're like me, then other things can become distracting. I never look. I'm always just. And I never find anything either. We've got to eliminate some distractions in our life. And this is what King Asa did. It says that he removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He went throughout every city in Judah looking around for anything that could take people's attention off of seeking God. And he went around. And not only did he remove it, but the Bible says he crushed it. He smashed it. He cut it down. He set it ablaze. He, he destroyed it. Now, how many of us, I know, if you're a Christian, your desire is to seek God. And you don't have to raise your hand to this, but how many of you are distracted whenever it comes to seeking God? Because I have seen Christians that have sacrificed their quiet time with God for screen time on social media. I have seen Christians that have sacrificed their relationship with God on the altar of their career. I have seen Christians that have sacrificed their intimacy with God on a friendship or a relationship. And I think that if we want to experience these biblical principles of God, we're going to have to learn how to eliminate some distractions in our life. Now, I'm not saying you need to eliminate your job. I understand we all need a job. But I think there could be a point sometimes to where the job has become a shrine or an altar for us. You know what the word worship means? 
It means to assign value to something. Whenever we worship God, we're assigning value to him. But how many of us worship so many other things and assign value to other things more so than we do to God? It's, that's what I'm talking about. We're going to have to learn to prioritize some things in our life. We're going to have to learn how to cut down. It says he cut down the Asherah poles. Now, Asherah was the, the Greek goddess of happiness and good fortune. The people wanted to be happy and of good fortune, so they would, they would erect these large poles in honor of the Greek goddess Asherah. There's going to be some things we're going to have to cut off. Now, I'm not saying you, you shouldn't be happy or want good fortune. I'm not saying that. But if that's your God, if that's what you're looking to, if you're wanting to be comfortable and have everything just go your way, then that's what you're going to erect in front of God. That's what you're placing your value in. That can be a huge distraction from seeking the Lord. Can I step on toes just a little bit this morning? I know some that have sacrificed seeking the Lord on the Asherah pole of politics. Kind of hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> because we, we want our political way so much that we almost block out what God may be trying to do or what God might want to do. You know, I, I, it was several months ago, I just felt so much peace in my heart. Even though the nations are raging all around the world, I just felt so much peace in my heart that, hey, it doesn't matter which, this was before the election took place, I, in, in my heart I said, it doesn't matter which way it goes for me because I know where my hope is. And I know that my God can use any political figure or anything to accomplish his desires. See, as Christians, we, we, sometimes we just have to cut down some things in our life and say, hey, listen, I'm not saying that this isn't important. I'm not saying that politics is not an important part of, of culture. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is this. We can't sacrifice what we believe in God because of things around us. We have to learn to eliminate some distractions in our life. Here's point number two. We need to pursue God's presence. When it comes to seeking God, we're going to have to eliminate some distractions. And as a people, we're going to have to learn how to pursue God's presence. I love this in 2 Chronicles 14, verse 4. It says, he commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his law and his commands. Now, this word commanded comes from the Greek word amor, amor. And it doesn't mean like a royal decree. It just means to speak. And so it says, Asa commanded the people. He didn't say, hey, there's this royal decree, and if you violate this royal decree, off with your head. That's not what he's saying. It's saying Asa commanded the people. Asa spoke to the people. In other words, Asa's determination to seek the Lord and Asa, being vocal about seeking God, challenged the people of Judah to do the same. It was an example that he was leaving for the people that he was leading. Asa sought the Lord. And because he was so determined to do so, the people that were under him looked to him and said, hey, I can do that too. I can do that too. We should pursue God's presence. We should pursue God's presence. I want to show you, though, what it means for most Christians to pursue God's presence. Dustin, would you mind helping me out for just a moment? I just need someone to hold something for me. Could you do that for me? Thank you. All right, so uh, Dustin, you, you're going to be God for just a moment. Is that all right? You're going to represent God in this illustration. Um, most of us, whenever it comes to seeking God, we think of it as, hey, I've got to take my prayer needs to God. Would you mind standing right over here, Dustin, please? And we think we've we got to take my prayer needs to God. And so, you know, I'm going to seek God with, with prayer. So I'm going to give this to God. This is my prayer needs. I know God is strong enough. I know he's capable enough, so I'm going to go to God 
in prayer. So let's see here. We got a couple of prayer needs here. What's one thing everybody prays for? Family. Got to pray for my family. Got to pray for my family. All right. Uh, we're in a whole pandemic. Everyone's been, you know, God keeping healthy. Keep us healthy. We got to got to pray for this. Thank you so much, God. Thank you so much. Uh, God, you know, there's there's this one person at work that has really been under my skin. And the thing about it is, is, is they've got influence. It's my supervisor. It's, you know, whoever. I God, I need you to help people's opinion about me to be good. I need their opinion about me to be good. People's opinion is important to me. God, I have, I have a, a strained relationship in my life. There's a strained relationship. My, my son doesn't follow you, Lord, and we've had conversation, and it's been tough, and, and these things are going on. There's a strained relationship. God, I, I need you to hold that for me. Thank you. Oh, man. Uh, that God would raise my child's dog to life because I accidentally ran over it with the car. Mike, some of you are laughing because that's a prayer that you have prayed or something similar to that. Oh, God, please. You know, I'm sorry, little Timmy. He must have run away. I don't know what happened, but God, please help this. <laughs> God, my political preference. I want my political preference to be done. Uh, finances. God, I really need help with finances. I've been without a job for two months. I really need help with finances. Uh, current problems in my life. Man, I, I've got a lot of uh, problems. Uh, uh, Susie over here uh, is talking about me at work. And uh, Johnny over there, uh, he never returned my paint sprayer. And all this stuff is, is going on. I've got a lot of problems. God, help me with that. And because of all that stuff, I've got some anxiety, God. I really need <laughs> I really need you here. I've got some anxiety going on. Uh, Lord, I need your provision. I need your provision in my life. I need these things going. Okay, thank you, God. Uh, Lord, I, I really want favor. I want favor. I've got there's this job opportunity to open up. God, please give me favor. Uh, Lord, help me in my career. I've, I've, got, I've got some important things going on. I've got some deadlines to me. God, help me in my career. I really want that promotion. Um, Lord, I, I'm also juggling school at the same time. Help me with these classes. Help me get good grades. I know I haven't studied enough, but I really want some good grades. Um, oh, God, I, I've, I've kind of run out of time. But, God, you know the rest of my needs. So there we go. Thank you so much, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the Bible tells us to make our requests made known to God. I'm not saying don't pray for these things. None of those things were, were bad things to pray about. There's nothing too big or too small that we can't carry to God in prayer. We, we sang a song on it this morning, what a friend we have in Jesus. But if that's the way we view seeking God, then we have it all wrong. Because what happens is the next day, you're going to say, you know, i got to make a habit of, of praying. i got to make a habit of praying. God, thank you so much. I don't have near as much time as I had yesterday, but you know my needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Next day rolls around. It's Wednesday now. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I missed yesterday. <laughs> but I have a lot of needs. i got a lot of stuff going on. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. And this is the way... We think seeking God is. But how many of you notice this? Even the things that we should be praying for have become a distraction. I'm not saying don't pray for these things. We should. But instead of just taking it all to God and, and putting it in his hands and, and walking away, what we should do is this. Here we go, Dustin. I've got a lot of things going on. Obviously, you know that. But for just a moment, I just want to talk to you. I just want to be with you. I just want to know you more. I want to know your heart more. And I've, I've still got these things, but I'm just going to leave them at your feet. Because I know you're big enough and strong enough to handle them. I've seen you do it before. I'll see you do it again. But right now, God, I just want to be with you. You. I've got 30 minutes before work. I just want to be with you. Come on, y'all. Thank you so much, Dustin. We 
We've got to learn how to pursue the presence of God. To pursue his presence, not just his, his gifts, his presence, but his presence, who he is. We've got to pursue his heart. So I want to show you, this is helpful for me. I'm not saying that there's a magical formula to pursuing the presence of God. I'm not saying that at all. But here's some things that help me out whenever it comes to a personal prayer time. If you're taking notes, write these things down. Because even if you've been praying for years and years and years and years and years, maybe this is some, one of these things is something that you could apply in your life that could help change some things and make this relationship with God fresh. So here's number one, set an appointment. Set an appointment. Whenever it comes to seeking the presence of God, I have found it helpful for me to set an appointment. Because if I don't, there's going to be other distractions, other things come up. Instead, you set an appointment and you say, hey, listen, you know, I'm going to shut my bedroom door. Y'all don't bother me until I come out. I've got an appointment with Jesus right now. <laughs> set an appointment. This is biblical. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. It was often. He had a routine. He had something that he did continually and on a, on a schedule almost. He set an appointment. Here's number two. So after you set an appointment, you get in that place where you can, where things can be quiet. Here's number two. Be still and worship. Be still and worship. Psalms 100 verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. You know the very best way you could start off your prayer time with is just being thankful. Again, not, God, these are all my needs. This is what I have going on. But, God, you are good. And now that I'm praying about it, I remember what you did this last week. I haven't even thought about it. God, I'm so sorry. I hadn't even thought about it. But you were so good, and you moved in that situation. And, and I didn't even recognize it until right now as I'm giving you thanks. And, and you, I mean, Honestly, just pump God up. Not that he can be lifted up or, or, or pumped up, but just, just praise him. Just give him thanks. Let that be the way you enter into his presence. Here's the third thing. Pray. Bring those needs to God. And I think a great thing that has helped me out is I write down my prayers. I write them down because I'm able to go back and look at them and think, oh, I forgot to pray for that this week. I'm glad I wrote that down. Or I'm able to go back and look and say, hey, God, you answered this. I didn't even realize, but you answered this prayer. Thank you. It's a wonderful thing that you can do in your prayer time. And here's the last thing. So there's just four things. Set an appointment. Worship and praise. Pray and, and write it down. And here's the fourth thing. Read the Bible and listen for God to speak. Before you open up your Bible, just say, Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would help these words to come alive in my heart, that what I read today, I would be able to apply in my life today in Jesus' name. And then read the word of God and listen for the Holy Spirit to speak. There may be one word on that page that jumps out to you, and it could change the entire outlook of the rest of your day. It's incredible. We just have to learn to seek the presence of God. And I understand that things seem crazy right now, and it it makes, I'm a very practical person. This is why I'm giving practical uh, tips on how to do some things because I'm a very practical person. And to me, it, I, I fight within myself between the spiritual and the practical because if I see something that's wrong over here, I in my flesh want to attack that with a practical solution. But a lot of times there's not a practical solution, but there's a spiritual solution. And so I look for practical ways to deal with things. If I got a prayer need, sometimes I won't even pray to God about it. Sometimes I'll just try to figure it out on my own. Anybody ever done that? And later on you're like, man, I, I really should have prayed about that. That's on me. My goodness. We want to attack things with practical solutions. But I want you to notice what happens when you seek the, the heart and the presence of God is that he works in those areas. I want you to notice, the Bible tells us in, in uh, 2 Chronicles 14, what we just read earlier, the Bible tells us in verse 9, it says, once an Ethiopian named Zerah attacked Judah with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. Now, I feel like I should remind you, First and Second Chronicles is a historical account of real events that took place. 
Let me ask you, did, did you go to school and read in history books about events and they never told you the date? No. Any event you read about in historical books, they, they tell you the date that it occurred because it's important, right? I love how there was so much peace in the kingdom of Judah that the person who's chronicling these events is just like, wow, oh, hey, y'all remember that time uh, there was a million men. What was his name? Uh, Z- Zerah. He, he and a million men attacked you. What year was that? Was that the second year of Asa's, third year of Asa's reign? When, when was that? Like, I love that it's just like, Oh, yeah, there's this one time that a million people attacked us, but, you know, nothing came of it. Like, they ran for their lives. Like, there's so much peace. And Asa, instead of going into the presence and praying, he could have said, hey, we, we got to round up more troops. We've got 580,000. We need to go get every person of fighting age. We need to go house to house and grab every spear, every knife, every shield, every piece of armor that we could possibly collect because we're about to be attacked by a million people. That would have been my response. But I love Asa. His heart was so set on seeking the Lord that he took what he already had and said, okay, y'all, y'all sit up over here, y'all sit up over here. I'll be right back. I got to go get in the presence of God. And he went and he sought the Lord for the issue. And because he sought the Lord, the Lord fought on their behalf. And it's almost like a little blimp in Judah's history Because they're like, oh, yeah, we don't really remember when this happened, but once we were attacked by a million people. (laughs) No big deal. It was just a million. It was easy, super easy. I love that. God is so good. He is so good. So point number one, eliminate distractions. Point number two, pursue his presence. And point number three, live in Christ Jesus. Live in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 6 through 7 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And then he tells us how to pray. He says, Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Wow. Wow. Even when you're attacked by a million, I think so many of us were like, God, well, Susan at work is really getting on my nerves. And she's telling my boss these things that are not true. God, I cannot believe it. I just feel so persecuted. Listen, if God can fight off a one million man army by his own lonesome self, then what could he do in your life too if we would just learn to seek his presence? If we would just learn to live in Christ Jesus and allow that peace to guard our hearts and minds. Can I encourage you today, if you are at all anxious about anything that's going on in our world today, I want to encourage you to take a day off. If you possibly can, say, you know, hey, boss, is it all right if I take off next week on Tuesday? To, I mean, literally, take some time and get in the presence of God. Devote some time to that. Seek his presence and make it a habit in your life because for those that live in Christ Jesus, it tells me here that God's peace will guard your heart and mind. We don't have, this is so good, and I know this sounds cliche to say as a Christian, but we don't have to worry about anything. We literally have nothing to worry about. It says, let's read it again. First Corinthians, or uh, Philippians chapter 4, it says, don't worry about anything anything at all. Don't worry about it. Live in Christ Jesus and his peace will guard your heart and your mind. So good. It's so good. Here's the wonderful thing about that. When we are at peace in Christ Jesus, nothing and no one can take that away from you. Nothing 
and no one, a one million man army included, cannot take that peace from you. John chapter 14, verse 27. I am leaving you with a gift. Here's the gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. For those who live in Christ Jesus, we have been given a gift of peace of mind and heart. Y'all know the song. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Thank you, God. Here's the last verse I want to share with you this morning. Colossians 3, verse 15. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Always be thankful. In 2021, we have so many reasons to be thankful. So many reasons. We always have a reason to be thankful. But I love this. It says, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. This word rule, I I love sports. Any sports fans in here? Does anybody like baseball anymore? I love, it's, that's my sport. Come on, Jim Davenport, I'm with you. I like football, I like basketball, those are great, but baseball is still king in my heart. Not king over Jesus, of course, but I love baseball. And the term that Paul, as he's writing this in Colossians 3, Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, and he tells them this, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. That word rule means to umpire. It's a sports term. Paul is using sports terms to preach the gospel. He says, let the peace of Christ umpire in your heart. Now, it's not so much today, but uh, back several years ago before Instant Replay, if the umpire made a call, that was it. You could argue that the manager could go and kick dust on the umpire and spit on his shoes. He could argue until he's blue in the face. It did not matter. The umpire's rule is what stood. And that's, what, that's the way God wants us to view this. Let his peace rule in your hearts. Let his peace call the shots in your life. Don't let, don't let the culture determine your peace. Don't let culture determine your outlook or, or anything that you, don't, don't let those things determine any outcome of your life. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let that call the shot. So this week, I want to challenge you. I know I kind of already gave you a challenge to, to take a day this next week that you could just cut out a, a section of time from your day to just spend in the presence of God. But maybe that's not a, uh, maybe that's something that you can't do this week. Here's something everyone can do this week, though, is just start each morning with an appointment. Set an appointment each morning. And if I could give you any advice, because this is something I've struggled with and I know all too well, uh, but this thing right here, <laughs> if this is the first thing you look at in the mornings, maybe for this next week, Whenever you wake up, maybe just don't look at that until you've spent time in the presence of God. Because I know it's real easy to get on this and to look at things, and that kind of sets the tone for the rest of your day. You're already upset. You're already frustrated before you even get out of bed sometimes. But instead, this week, set an appointment with God. Eliminate the distractions. Pursue His presence, not just the things he can give, but pursue his presence and live each day in Christ Jesus. Lord, we love you so much. God, we thank you for your heart. We thank you for your word, God. And I pray that this week, the people of God, the believers, those who trust in you, that we would be that kind of person that just starts each day in your presence, that we would just become staunch about it. Like, d- don't, don't disturb me. I'm going to make my coffee. Leave me alone until I've been in God's presence. God, I pray that that would be our attitude, that that would be our heart, Lord, that we would desire your presence more than anything else in our life. And God, I thank you for the principle behind seeking you, the promise that you've given us that those who seek you will be blessed. And those that seek you live at peace. God, we thank you so much for your word. 
And I pray that we would apply that to our hearts and our lives this week. In Jesus' name. Come on, someone say amen. Amen. Be blessed in the Lord this week. Leave in peace and have peace all this week because he is a good God. He is a good God.